This is the Unique Scotland podcast with exclusive scottishvisits.co.uk. Hello, this is John Harbour, and welcome to Unique Scotland, the podcast from my website, exclusivescottishvisits.co.uk. I'm recording this in Tunbridge Wells today, a lovely market town just south of London. I'm staying with some lovely friends and helping to babysit my godson, three-year-old Nicholas, and also look after his wee brother Lucas. Gorgeous boys. Thankfully, this part of southern England is not under the most stringent Covid restrictions, so it was possible for me to travel down from Scotland to here a couple of days ago. Today in the south of England it's raining with a temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius or 62 degrees Fahrenheit. On my last podcast I reported a temperature of 24 degrees in New York and looking at today's weather over there you're down to 17 degrees with rain as well. In Beijing it's 8 degrees so not far off the Scottish weather we're having at the moment up north. But today we're all in Inverness virtually and last week you had a walking tour of the town and I told you about some of the more prominent features and buildings including the old toll booth and the townhouse and I tried to give you a feel of what Inverness would have looked like in the 16th century. In this Inverness part 3 we are going to leave the city and head north over the Kessock Bridge onto the Black Isle then west towards Loch Hugh passing amazing sights such as the Corishalic Gorge. Then we'll drive on to the Gairloch and stroll along the wonderful white sandy beach. There will be stories of Russian convoys, an island that is still uninhabited because of a secret testing during the Second World War, and the fabulous Loch Marie, visited by Queen Victoria, with a waterfall nearby that has taken Victoria's name. We will then return to Inverness, and this part of the journey will be cut into two sections, as this would be a long session without a divide. It's a lovely drive over to the west coast, and we'll be passing through the highlands of Wester Ross, and I'm delighted that you have decided to join me on this tour. I do hope you enjoy these virtual journeys, as I love to share Scotland with you, and hopefully this will whet your appetite to come and visit this fine country. You can also visit my website, www exclusivescottishvisits.co.uk to hear more of my tours and see some of the wonderful photos and videos I've taken associated with all my own journeys around Scotland. Well, whatever way you intend to see Scotland, either virtually or by visiting, then I hope that by listening to this podcast and viewing my monthly video podcast, you get a real feel for what this magical land of the Scots has to offer you. So I would now like you to relax wherever you are and thoroughly enjoy the third part of your unique Scotland tour from Inverness to the Gairloch and back. Take time out for the next 30 minutes or so to enjoy a wee look at Scotland through a Scotsman's eye. Having got to know Inverness, which is apparently the happiest place in Great Britain, over the last two days it's time to strike north. Well, bags packed, bills paid at the Glenmore Hotel, we drive out of the city to pick up the road to the north, and we soon come to the Kessock Bridge, which will take us onto the Black Isle and beyond. We will be crossing the Bewley Firth on the left-hand side and the Murray Firth on the right. The word Firth F-I-R-T-H comes from the word fjord, which you will all have heard of associated with countries such as Norway. Well, it's the same here. It's a long river leading out to the sea, and in this case the North Sea, created by activity of glaciation and erosion millions of years before. The Murray Firth runs along the coast of the county of Murray, while the Bewley Firth takes its name from a small town called Bewley, on the upper reaches of this wide river. 
Now, Bewley has a ruined priory dating from the 13th century and was home to Valescollian monks who came from Val des Choux, or the Valley of the Cabbages near Dijon in France. And the name Bewley, or Beaulieu in French, actually means beautiful place. And the town certainly fits the description and is well worth a visit if you're going to be in this area. Coming back to the Kessock Bridge, it's another wonderful feat of engineering. It was opened in 1982, it's 3,500 feet long, or just over a 1,000 metres. The river below is a navigable waterway, and that actually picks up the ships coming out of the Caledonia Canal off to the North Sea. So the bridge is raised to a high level, and the four towers dominate the Inverness skyline, especially at night when they're all lit up. It actually replaced a ferry, or people could just drive around the coast via Bewley to get to the north. Now, if you've listened to my previous podcasts, you will have heard me talking about the Great Glen geological fault line that runs northeast, southwest through the Great Glen. Well, as it happens, Inverness is at the head of the Great Glen, and the bridge straddles that fault line. To protect against any potential seismic activity, the bridge construction included seismic buffers at the base of the North Tower. Just staggering. Anyway, Crossing the bridge is a joy in itself, with the views down across Inverness and the exit of the Caledonia Canal to the left, and on the right you can see well down the Murray Firth towards the North Sea itself. On a clear day you might even be able to see Fort George, an amazing structure that juts right out into the Murray Firth, a barracks built for around a thousand soldiers, built in the late 1700s after the final Jacobite battle at Culloden. Well, we're soon on to the Black Isle, and I'm often asked where the name comes from. Firstly, it's not an island, but a peninsula surrounded on three sides by the sea. To be honest, no one really knows where the name comes from, but there are a number of stories, and the one I like is that in the winter, where everywhere around the Black Isle is white with snow, the influence of the warmer sea around the peninsula means that the snow does not lie very long, and the ground looks black compared to the white snow-laden areas around. The Black Isle story is a tale in itself, and one of the small towns is called Cromarty, which most people will have heard of from the long-range BBC weather forecast. The Black Isle itself has much to offer the visitor, and I will be doing a separate podcast on this special place. Well, after a few miles we take a left fork onto the A835 to head west towards Conan Bridge and Dingwall. If we'd continued north, we would have crossed the Cromarty Firth, and continued on to Invergordon, Tain, and for whisky lovers, the Glen Morangi Distillery, or Glen Morangi for those that would prefer to pronounce it that way. It doesn't take long to arrive at Conan Bridge, which is near to the market town of Dingwall. The town Conan itself is on the southern bank of the River Conan, with Maryborough on the other side of the river. It only has a population of around 2,000 people, with basic amenities for locals. It does have a primary school for pre-12-year-olds, but once the children reach secondary age, they have to go to Dingwall for further education. This is not uncommon in the Highlands and the Islands, where junior schools are provided locally, but the more senior schools are in a larger town. As we cross Conan Bridge, the yellow flowers of the gorse and broom are evident on both sides of the river embankments. Birch trees are abundant, and because the towns either side are so small, and built away from the bridge, is like being in the countryside with a lovely river flowing below. We continue along the A835 for about five miles, and there are a number of interesting tourist spots to visit. For example, the first is the Highland Museum of Childhood. It's about two miles off the route to the north. It's quite something and is located in the small town of Strathpeffer, and actually located in the Strathpeffer railway station. It was originally started from a doll and toy collection of a former Strathpeffer resident, Mrs Angela Kelly. Over the years, further toys, games and children's books and photographs have been added. Strathpeffer itself is a lovely village with distinctive Victorian architecture, built during the popular spa resort boom. Sulphur springs were discovered in the 18th century and the pump room in the middle of the village dates from 1819. Continuing along the road near Tarvey, we come across Rogie Falls, a series of waterfalls on the Blackwater, a local river. 
There's a footbridge across the river that can take five people at a time, and the views are stunning. Continuing on, we come to the small town of Garvey, served by the Garvey Railway Station on the Kyle of Localsh line, which crosses the A835, which is the road we're on, by a level crossing. Now, there's not many trains each day, but the level crossing has the reputation for the most accidents in the United Kingdom. Now, it's an old statistic, but it's one that stayed with me for many years. And the reason for the accidents was that the level crossing area was open. There's no barrier. It's just operated by traffic lights alone. And this is certainly one place you do not want to jump the lights. Well, ten miles further on, we arrive at a large body of water. This is Loch Gascarnoch, and is a man-made reservoir, which opened in 1957 as part of the Conan Hydroelectric Power Scheme. The dam is huge and stands at 92 feet high and 1,700 feet across. About halfway up the loch is a viewpoint and the view is glorious. The countryside around is small rounded hills covered in heather and bracken, but beyond you can see mountains on every side. To the east you've got Ben Wyvis, to the north Ben Derg, and to the south Skirmore, and all over 3,000 feet or 1,000 metres high, and therefore qualifying as Munro's. I stop because there were reports that the hot summer weather had dried out part of the reservoir. Now, I recall the Scotsman newspaper of 20th of August, and they had a headline which said, Lost World Emerges in the Highlands as Water Levels Fall. And there were some intriguing photographs showing an old road from Ullapool to Dingwall, when the dam was constructed, the valley was flooded, and the road, small bridges and villages were covered, and remain so today. However, in particularly dry spells, it's possible to look once more into the past and imagine what it would have been like to live in a small cottage by a single-track road near to the old river. Of course, the hydroelectric power scheme brought electricity to the glens and into thousands of homes. Progress, obviously, but still tinged with sadness, when you see the old townships and roads that were sacrificed to allow the unstoppable march of progress. As we drive on, it's only five miles later that we arrive at the junction for either the Gerloch to the west or Ullapool to the northwest. We will visit Ullapool on another occasion when I cover the North Coast 500, so the intention is to turn left onto the A832 towards Dundonnell, Alt Bay and Gerloch. There is also one more sign showing the Corishalloch Gorge half a mile away. And sure enough, after half a mile, there's a large car park on the right-hand side where you can gain access to this extraordinary feature. Leaving the car, we pay a small fee into an honesty box and pass through a swing gate and descend a steep, winding, wooded hill. After five minutes, you arrive at a footbridge spanning an incredible gorge and waterfalls below. The footbridge is 85 feet long and was constructed by Sir John Fowler and who was also one of the designers of the Fourth Rail Bridge dating from 1880. The Corishallet Gorge is one of the most spectacular gorges in Scotland. It is designated a National Nature Reserve in recognition of the amazing gorge and waterfalls and the surrounding woodland. It formed around ten to 13,000 years ago as melt water from ice sheets that came thundering down from the rapidly melting northern glaciers. There's a mile-long canyon through which the river Droma rushes. From the Victorian suspension bridge, you can look down upon a series of crashing waterfalls hundreds of feet below. And, when you get to the other side of the bridge, you can continue on along a narrow wooded path to arrive at a viewing platform to get a different view of the gorge and waterfalls. There's only one hitch to visiting the bridge, and that is getting back across the river. The bridge restricts numbers crossing to just six people at a time, so if there are a lot of visitors, it can get a bit busy. However, it's worth it and a must-visit if in the area. Well, after we get back across the bridge, we trudge up the hilly footpath back to the car. As we continue on our journey, we are surrounded by a relatively flat, treeless land covered in heather, and on a clear day we can see the mountains to the north, such as Mail Dew. But, straight ahead, an area that is commonly nicknamed the Great Wilderness, one can see a towering mountain called Antelach, and that's in Gaelic. In English, it's the Anvil, 
are the forge. The word forge is probably more appropriate, as the mountain's name refers more to the colours of the terrain in certain lighting conditions rather than the shape. The mountain is 3,500 feet high, just over 1,000 metres, so qualifies as a Monroe, which, as I've mentioned before, is any mountain in Scotland over 3,000 feet. The mountain itself is made of Torridon sandstone, which is named after the local area of Torridon, and has terrace sides riven with deep gullies and a sharp rocky summit. It dominates the area and will be visible to us on most of the journey. As we pass through the village of Dundonnell, we are only about two miles from its base, and as we continue on from this tiny hamlet, Little Loch Broom comes into view on the right-hand side. The sister loch and slightly larger Loch Broom is off to the north, and that's the loch upon which sits the town of Ullapool. Like its sister loch, Little Loch Broom is a sea loch and connects to the Atlantic. It's possible to fish on the loch from the shore or by boat, but you have to obtain a fishing permit from a local post office. Normal catch, brown trout or sea trout, not dissimilar to salmon. The loch is a conservation area and it's always fascinating to watch numerous cormorants with wings outstretched sunning themselves on the pinnacles of rock that stick out of the loch. We continue on and come to the small settlement of Mungsdale and as we do we're starting to head south again and the site that greets us on the right hand side of the car just as we've turned the corner is a fabulous beach that the west coast is so famous for. And if we look in the distance, we can also see the outline of the outer Hebridean island of Lewis. Well, we continue on and come to Grenard Bay, and the sands and blue sea are so inviting that we just have to pull over to the side of the road and take a stroll along the deserted beach. And this is not uncommon in this part of the world, and it feels like you're on a deserted island as you kick up the sand and look across the bay, over the clear blue water, to the Atlantic beyond. Before we leave Grenard, it's worth mentioning one good and one not so good thing about this area. The first thing that I should mention is that this whole area was once part of the Mackenzie lands, so if you belong to that clan, you must come see what you're missing. As we reach the Grenard River, which runs into Grenard Bay, we find ourselves at Grenard House and estate that used to belong to a successful Victorian industrialist in the 1890s. He developed the house to its present size, which was used as a sporting and holiday lodge. I mentioned the Outer Hebrides, the islands that could be seen from the beach of Grenard Bay. They are a great asset to the house because they actually protect this area from the North Atlantic gales by acting as a barrier during the more destructive storms. The great advantage to this west coast of Scotland is that the Gulf Stream flows by and gives it a warmer climate from the east coast and allows for more tropical types of plants to grow. Now, I'm not suggesting for one moment that you can get your bikini out and sunbathe on a regular basis. The temperature difference between east and west is marginal, but it's just enough on the west coast to give more tropical plants the ability to survive. Grenard Garden evolved from a kitchen garden and is hidden from immediate view, so it's a glorious surprise when you see it for the first time. It's in a wonderful setting, with the mountains towering over the bay, with a view of the bay and Atlantic to die for, and the sound of the river Grenard running past with a roar when in spate, and murmuring when running at a gentler pace. The garden's quite small, but the quality is outstanding. It's rectangular with three pathways. There's an orchard at the end with pergolas with apples and climbing roses giving height and structure to the garden. There are an enormous variety of shrubs and perennials, and fruits and vegetables also thrive in this space. So you can see what a delight this house and garden are in the midst of the beauty of the highlands. So, another must see when on a tour of the northwest. Grenard House and gardens are terrific, and we get a fond farewell from the gardener as we depart for Gairloch, and on to another sandy beach at Gairloch Bay. So that was the good thing that I was going to tell you about in this area, but I also mentioned the not-so-good and that involves an island used by the Ministry of Defence during the Second World War. But, sadly, I'm going to have to bring that story to you in the second part of this journey, our journey back to Inverness, and that will be next week. I'm stopping to ensure this journey is not too long for you to endure, which is often the way when I'm touring with clients or guests, as I prefer to call them. I don't want to exhaust you, so I'm going to finish here for this week and look forward to bringing part two to you next week. 
In the next podcast, we will be continuing our Inverness to Gairlock tour and be heading from Grenard Bay onto the Gairlock, which is also part of North Coast 500, and come back via Loch Marie and tell you about Queen Victoria's visit to the area before arriving once more at Inverness. Thank you once more to the comments from listeners and for your supportive emails. I know that Jeff and Dorsey will be listening and I hope you had a great time with John and Caroline on John's 60th birthday, just when life begins. Can I also say thank you to Amanda for the photo of her lovely whippets, Ronnie and Hermione. You'll have to get Bill into the next photo, please, Amanda, but they do look great. For information, I'll be doing a live event on Zoom through Eventbrite next month, and this will be advertised on all channels, so watch out for that one. It would be good to have you all online and immediately interactive as well. I now appear on a few channels, and you will be listening to me either directly from the website or on one of the Spotify, Google, Apple, etc. channels under the name of Unique Scotland. You can also find me on Twitter at ESVJohn, so look me up and follow and mention our connection. I do hope that you've enjoyed this week's podcast as much as I have enjoyed bringing it to you. Any comments are most welcome, and drop me a line using the contact page of my website, www.exclusivescottishvisits.co.uk. I always like to hear how and where you are listening to my podcasts. Well, I wish you continuing health and happiness, and during these very strange times, do keep up the morale and stay safe. And when I say morale, I remember serving as a sailor on a British destroyer, and we'd come through some tough exercises that were both exhausting and draining. Morale on board was low, but I do remember hearing over the tannoy system an announcement that all shore leave was cancelled until morale improved. Well, that was just great. And, of course, an apocryphal story but I'd like to leave that with you for the time being. One final thing. It's a final thought and a phrase that rings true if you just give it a thought for a moment. And this is it. It isn't your position, but your disposition that makes you happy or sad. So, think happy thoughts and boost your own morale. That said, I send my very best wishes to you all, and I raise a glass in the traditional Scottish way, Slangeva. listening to the Unique Scotland podcast with exclusive scottishvisits.co.uk. To receive all our episodes automatically, please subscribe now.